While losing a 3-1 lead in the playoffs isn't that uncommon anymore, the ripple effect of the Clippers' collapse against the Nuggets in the second round was profound. Doc Rivers fired, three major rotation guys cut loose, and replacements that may or may not give them the upgrades they need to fulfill all the trash talk fueled by signing two of the top players in the NBA last year. Let's examine the moves they made to figure out if the other LA basketball team has a chance to win an NBA title. The Nuggets series might have served as a wake-up call. Perhaps Doc Rivers wasn't the man to lead this group, perhaps relying on an undersized center who provides no spacing and less defense was a playoff liability, and perhaps letting Kawhi Leonard run a lot of the show would create a toxic environment in a situation that had to be closer to perfect to get to the finals. We got a little bus throwing under of Doc from Paul George this offseason. We lost. We like cool. We up 3-2. We're going to win the next one. We lost, but during that during that whole process, like we we never worked on adjustments. We never worked on what to do differently. Um, we just literally having the same happen over and over again. So the conversation is like, nah, we gonna be all right. The conversation should have been like, nah, we need to change this. Do. Yeah, mm-hmm. we need to switch this up. And the Athletics' Jovan Bua gave me a little more insight into the issues from the bench. Zubats was a plus eleven. And of course, I mean, he plays more with the starters, so like it's it's a little weighted that way. But Trez was minus 30 in 80 minutes, and it's like, how are you guys getting killed with Kawhi and PG on the floor, with, you know, in those minutes? And and it just was like kind of jarring to see, even with their two best players, it wasn't saving Trez. He, he was still their seventh or eighth guy when it was like clear right now he might be our ninth or tenth guy in the rotation. Right. So. That I think that was, and then I, I think again, like they talked to Doc, and, and Doc was like, "Trez is better," and we're like, "We don't see how you're coming to that conclusion." Like, okay. you know, it's not the eye test, it's not the stats. What what are you seeing? So Steve Ballmer took care of the adjustments by changing Doc Rivers into Tyron Lu and Montrez Harrell into Serge Ibaka. It might not be completely fair to point the biggest finger at Harrell's defense in the bubble, considering he had gone through a very tough loss off the court. But the evidence is irrefutable that he simply was not effective on the court on either end, and his lack of production, particularly in games 5 and 6, helped sink the Clippers. Some issues Harrell had were simply playing the center position at 6'7", and by replacing him with an incredibly long 7-footer changes the equation immediately. Ibaka still has a real knack for blocking shots when coming over from the weak side, making offensive players think twice when approaching from the wing, and he has enough left in the tank at 31 to give you multiple efforts to contest shots and get physical for rebounds. That said, he also struggles to contain quick guards these days, lacking the lateral quickness he used to have earlier in his career. There are times he can recover to block the shot, but the number of plays where he gets blown by are increasing. And in the context of replacing Harrell, it's possible Clippers fans might throw their hands up at times, wondering if he has any better effect defensively. Looking at the advanced stats, you can see that during the regular season, Harrell had a better impact than Serge did on this end of the floor. But in the most important part of the season, you can see how these numbers radically change, which is exactly what the Clippers brought him across country for. The Clippers clearly felt like protecting the rim was an area they needed to improve. And it's the same kind of protection you need for all sorts of balls as we approach the Christmas season. That's why I use Manscaped for unparalleled ball freshness that will guarantee the proper balls get swatted away while yours stay protected. Now, I got to admit, for the longest time, I just used their Lawn Mower 3.0. It's waterproof, rechargeable, and has an LED light to see the places where the sun don't shine. But recently, I started using all the products in their performance package, and it's been a revelation. The Crop Reviver is an uplifting experience. The Weed Whacker works so well, I have to hide it from the rest of my family. And you can keep your toenails in order with their luxury six-piece stainless steel nail kit. Let me be your not-so-secret Santa by getting you 20% off your order. And since Santa doesn't charge a shipping fee, neither does Manscaped. 
I know you've been on the nice list. Well, you could be in the naughty list too. So I'm throwing in two free gifts. Get the performance package and I'll throw in their shed travel bag and Manscaped anti-chafing boxer briefs. I wear them and I have no chafe. I freshened up so much, Manscaped gave me my very own link on their website. So make me look good by clicking on that link, get a great deal, and you'll be opening up the offense just like Serge does with his ability to stretch the defense. His range goes to the three-point line, which is something radically different compared to Harrell's hovering around the rim for punishing post-ups. I have no doubt Paul George and Kawhi Leonard will appreciate the open basket area a lot more this season, as Serge's most reliable action is to ball screen and then pop out to the perimeter. If his man sinks to help on drives, he'll be wide open to consistently hit these. And if his man honors Ibaka's shooting and sticks to him, expect to see a lot of drives like this, as Kawhi and PG can attack downhill to the front of the rim for easy scores. The other major adjustment they made with the roster was to bring in Luke Kennard and send Landry Shamit to Brooklyn. While Kennard had a career year in Detroit last year, he barely played due to his knee issues and we have to figure out if he was just accruing stats on a bad team. I was a bit surprised to realize how often he ran the pick and roll as the de facto point guard for this team, and there really was evidence of his ability to facilitate out of this action to set up teammates for open shots. However, this isn't really his thing. His decision making under duress on the fly isn't great, and it just looked uncomfortable to me being such a focal point of the offense. Don't get me wrong, he's got a good handle, and has certainly developed finishing skills, but there's too much evidence of him struggling with these types of plays. And thankfully, with Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, and Lou Williams on the team, he won't be asked to do this very much at all. And that frees him up for what he's genuinely great at, spotting up and shooting the heck out of the ball. It won't be hard to picture him in the lineup finding the open areas of the floor after Kawhi and PG break down the defense and kick the ball out to him. You might remember I had kind of predicted Landry Shamit to be the first high volume 50% shooter from three point land. And FYI, when he was on the court with both Leonard and George before the bubble, he was at 60% and then cooled off to 48% for the whole season. I won't go so far as to say Kennard gets to 50, but he should be treated to quite a lot of great looks out of this offense based on personnel. As long as he understands, that's what he's on the team for. Catch the ball and light him up. Whatever whispers there might be about Doc's coaching ability, and they're out there, the same could be said about Ty Lu, who had the benefit of taking over a LeBron-led team in midseason and guiding them to an improbable comeback in the finals. He's been there before, and despite the nagging questions as to who was really the coach of that team, he always impressed me with his after-timeout plays. A lot of their best action ran through the high post. The foundation was the high post split. And I know this is LeBron at the point of attack, but it wouldn't be hard to picture Kawhi or Paul George here. The split happens in the strong side corner, and running PG off the screen would get easy shots with no rotations nearby. But you can reverse this to the other side of the floor. Notice the pistol action as Fry screens before Smith gets the handoff. This opens up space for the pocket pass, where Zubots has really nice touch on his floaters. Plus, they have some very nice back screening options on the weak side where the shooter sets the screen, both defenders get hung up with him, and they get the easy deuce. Or the entry pass goes to the weak side high post, and LeBron just runs off the back screen at the elbow. This would be perfect for Kawhi as a quick hitter for an alley-oop. On the margins, they added Nicholas Batum, who could be used as a defender with diminished offensive skills, but they're going to ride the Kawhi PG train as far as those two can take him and it remains to be seen whether they can get by resting Kawhi so much, since he was clearly frustrated by the lack of cohesion, due, in large part, to his absence and load management. I gotta be honest with you, I don't think re-signing Marcus Morris was a great idea. I know the stats show he was a positive, but I worry about chemistry issues with a player like him who wanted to instigate as much as shoot the ball in the playoffs. So keep a raised eyebrow with that situation. The pressure is red hot on Coach Lou, as well as Paul George, to come through for them in the playoffs when they most need it. That said, I just don't feel like they made bold enough moves to radically affect the outcome of this season. So, the conference finals could easily be in their future, but I suspect that's as far as they'll go. 
The season is upon us, so please subscribe to B-Ball Breakdown so you can be alerted as soon as the next video drops. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and comment down below. I'll most likely respond, since at B-Ball Breakdown, it's not a channel, it's a conversation. You in?